Welcome to the pre-dawn gloriousness that is the African bush. Uh, we're sitting really still on top of a crest, listening for the call of a male leopard that's been going for the last little while. Hopefully we find him soon. This is Safari Live. Ready. Standing by. Murphy's Law, since we've been sitting quietly on the crest, no peep out of that big male leopard who's been calling constantly for about the last hour. And of course, this is a gorgeous Sunday morning here in the African bush. My name is Brent Leo Smith, and I have Brian Joubert and the Thumb, who's wearing his Sunday best today as we are in search of the incredible wildlife of Southern Africa. So Jamie, in, Jamie and Zunder, are uh, somewhere to the sort of northwest of us. We're trying to pin some movement to this male leopard. And a thanks to Lucy and Chris Rogue for their updates about the lions and leopards last night. We're going to go look for the lions a little later. We're going to try to focus on this leopard while he's calling and while he's on the move. Now, it's probably Tingana. It sounds like a big dominant male. And uh, we haven't seen any tracks yet, but we're hoping that his boisterous morning calling is going to give away his position and of course we are on a live African safari and it's warmish for us today it's about 12 degrees Celsius and I cannot for the life of me remember the Fahrenheit Brian do you remember the Fahrenheit? I don't. Uh, 54 there we go thank you final control and final control is Kirsten and Rebecca but no sound so we're gonna go find another listening spot Now this is my favorite time of the day. It's when the big cats are calling, the big cats are on the move. And Jamie and I are looking for the same big cat at the moment. So let's go see how her endeavors in the pre-dawn light are going. Good morning and welcome on this beautiful morning in the winter's African bush to our sunrise safari. My name is Jamie and I have Zunder on the back of the vehicle with me, along with a very special guest whose name is Jerry. And just everybody say a good morning to Jerry. There's Jerry sitting on the back and Jerry's going to help us as a third set of eyes to try and find this leopard that is calling. And I've got a horrible feeling we've actually got a race on our hands here. Because this male, and I'm pretty sure it is a male leopard, is walking very, very rapidly to the west. Now it doesn't look as though he stayed south towards Zoe's, it looks as though he's gone a little bit further north, which unfortunately means if he continues his mission to the west, he's going to cross into Simbambili, which is why we're racing, we've raced past a herd of elephants, we'll come back to them. Just want to make sure that he isn't somewhere around here, and I think, I was driving at the time, but I think I heard alarm calls somewhere here. But whichever male leopard it is that we're tracking, He's managed to somehow fly over all of the roads because I haven't picked up on a single leopard track. Or our elephant friends that we just found over there have walked over his tracks. A wonderful and exciting way to start off our morning. Oh my goodness, there's Brent. Standing by. Brent, I'm already on Impala Road. I think, I think I heard Kudu alarming around Power Lines Junction. Thanks, you too. Um, I didn't find any in Kwanzaa going up main access, but the whole Flamian law have walked along there and they're still there. Brent and I just having a chat about how we're going to plan the search. We had a minor, not a, not a disagreement, we had a, well, it was a bit of a disagreement, about which way the leopard was calling, which direction the leopard was calling from. So there's a slight, just a slight competitive edge to now finding this particular leopard. 
and I'm trying to go with gut instinct and in which paths Tingana walks. I'm just really hoping he's not on a mission straight back towards Simbabili. Come on, boy. Where are you hiding? And it's right at that grey time of dawn where the spotlight doesn't actually help you terribly much because it just lights up the bushes right in front of you and nothing else anywhere behind. But at the same time, your eyes haven't quite adjusted to the light. So everything looks a bit grey and flat. Except the elephants. They just look grey and three-dimensional. And we will go back to those elephants in a moment. I just want to try and find these kudu. I think I heard kudu. But I was driving at the time, so a kudu makes a deep, bassy alarm call, a deep bark. It goes something along the lines of bah! And they do it repeatedly whenever a leopard walks past them. And of course the other option is that he might have been moving, he's definitely marking his territory because he's doing that rasping, sawing sound that leopards do. But he might have spotted something that he wants to hunt, at which point he becomes even more difficult to find. And then, of course, we've got the added bonus of the Inkohumas, hopefully, being somewhere on our property. They were seen on the Juma Dam camera early, early this morning, around one o'clock, which is also a very positive sign because it means we can go and search for them. And I was so excited to hear that yesterday afternoon on the Sunset Safari, James finally had the brand new set of Nkuhuma cubs, the three of them that we've actually been watching since they were only a couple of days old when they were still at the Buffles Hook Dam Den. But then we couldn't find, well, we, could, we did know where they were, but we couldn't get to them. And we decided that we'd just leave them for the time being and wait for them to emerge. And now they have. So they're little, little, little lion cubs. And now we've got eight Nkuhumas bounding about somewhere. Now speaking of little lion cubs and of course little leopard cubs, Zuki's just pointed out, and watching in Tennessee, and by the way, good morning to you, that they are, lion cubs are very wobbly when they first emerge. Would we give them the same period of time before viewing them that we would leopard cubs? With the mother at the den, then we are happy to view them slightly earlier than leopard cubs. And the reason that we do that is because no hyena in its right mind is going to mess with a lioness and her cubs. So what we were doing is we were checking every day to see if they were still in the same den spot. And if mom wasn't there, then we immediately left and pulled out and left the little cubs to go about their business. If mom was there, then we did view them at a slightly younger age than we would leopard cubs. There are far more scary threats for a leopard than there are for a lion cub, just because the mothers are so much bigger and stronger. And we've also kept track. We're very careful about what's around us when we do do that. Then it becomes a little bit, basically those, man, those cubs that you are seeing now, they are very wobbly, are the same age as when we started viewing Karula's cubs. They're two months old and they've got the protection again, they've got the protection of mom. However, they seem to develop slightly slower than leopard cubs. Not, they don't climb trees as quickly, so that's why they look wobbly, but they're the same, roughly the same age. So it, it is very much circumstantial and it depends upon what's going on and then we treat them exactly the same way. So initially if they're showing signs of being very, very, if they're very tiny, if they're showing signs of being nervous, well, only one vehicle is allowed to go and look at them. If they're looking slightly more comfortable, confident, if they're around a static kill for example, then we have two vehicles in the sighting and we plan it like that and we, the person who finds them decides on the situation and the, the circumstances behind it and how many vehicles are allowed to come into the sighting. So we do it very, very carefully. We treat them with the same amount of respect, but we do handle them differently. Right, where is this leopard gone? I think I'm going to go and check the western edge of Juma. And while we do that, let's go over to Brent and find out how his search is going. We've got Impala alarm calling, staring into the bush here. Right 
this way. There he is, there's the male leopard. Hello, Mr. Leopard. Looks like Tingana. Hello, big boy. Oh, what a wonderful way to start the sunrise safari with our dominant big spotted cat. There we go. So, I think he must have passed just behind Jamie because Jamie's come through here and headed up towards Impala Road. Now, she had Kudu alarm calling there, so it could be shadow in that area, so we could have multiple leopards close by on this sunrise safari. Standing by. Balanite Street. <laughs> Jamie is just calling me over the radio, giggling. Where is he for a matter of interest? Uh, just letting her know, at the large Balanites tree. Hello, big boy. Come on, give us a call. Been calling so much. Looks like he has had a feed. He's, a, he's not grotesquely full like we see these big cats sometimes. But he's definitely eaten. There we go. He's going to go scent mark on the tree that has uh, embarrassed me slightly in the not too distant past. Isn't this incredible on a live African safari following a big male leopard on his morning territorial patrol? Now he's going to take us on an adventure if he keeps on that route. This is one of the largest areas on Juma where there is not a track, not a road apart from a little track to the Gari repeater that is sending you these pictures at the moment. Now this is a famous block for falling into artfog holes. Now, very, very observant of you lady lone wolf who's noticed he does have a lip. He's been sporting this limp for quite a while and like with male lions, it's not uncommon for the big male leopards to have a limp and it could have been from fighting, it could have been from mating, it could have also be from hunting. So even though I would say his limp has improved massively since the last time I had a good view of him, So we're definitely going to stick with him. He's heading to the southwest. So there's a strong possibility he's going to go visit Arethusa. But I think it's probably going to take him half an hour or so to get that side. And Brian and I were just saying we really felt like a good leopard sighting this morning. So the big cat gods are on our side. Or it could just be the fact that we are the killer bees. Now William's wondering what does it mean when a leopard's tail is curled up like that? Uh, normally just walking, um, if they raise their tail it's a sign of okay, okay, you got me, you spotted me. So when those impala were snorting, and could see him, his tail would have been quite a lot more vertical than it is. 
they will also sort of do it to show birds if birds start alarm calling. Just trying to find a route through this block to get into a good spot to see him. Oh, we've caught a big tree. Let's reverse a bit. Okay, I'm just going to try to get up ahead of him, then I'm going to stop. us now. Now if there's anyone new and you're wondering oh my goodness how can we get so close to one of Africa's dominant predators. Now it's by giving him his space. You see I, I've parked a bit far from him so if he wants to walk close to us then I let him do that and uh, he's grown up as a cub with with vehicles so he is used to it. There's one second I've got to be on the game drive. Morning, Tax. I've got Tingana um, heading southwest from the Balanites tree. Negative, I've got the animal. Um, if you come straight to the Balanites tree, um, his fumba is straight south, southwest from there in the block um, to the south of the Gari Repita. Um, he's still a bit further south. I would actually come on onto. Zoe is near the old Nisikaya and then listen for my audio. Sorry about that, I'm just letting Taxon, who's the ranger from Juma, know where we are. We all help each other out here in terms of finding the big cats. Marianne, wonderful to have you with us. Uh, Marianne, what's the point of a big male having such a thick neck? Well, Marianne, it's, to def it's because he has to fight with other male leopards. So like a male lion's got the big mane, a male leopard's got a big thick neck uh, to protect uh, his vital areas like his throat um, from, being able, from another male being able to grip onto it and do him some damage. So when leopards fight, it's generally front on, so lots of patting at the face and the neck, and if they try to actually grab around the neck, and uh, that's why they have that thick neck, is an extra layer of protection. So I'm gonna let you enjoy him. Well, I just call Taxi. Tax, um, come quickly a little bit. He's, he's quite, he's walking quite fast. Come, come quite quickly, he is walking quite fast. Ophem, um, we're about 200 meters from Zoe's now and he's still heading west. Um, I think maybe, maybe Triple M will be better. Uh, I'd say he's probably 600 meters from Triple M now. Okay, so we got to go through quite a thick, thick area. So we're going to go across to Jamie, who's got another member of Africa's Big Five on this glorious sunrise safari. 
What a beautiful way to start off our morning safari with a leopard with Brent and some elephants with myself. And it's interesting to see them feeding off guari bushes. The reason that the guari bushes always look so green and luscious whilst everything else looks a little bit brown and dead is the fact that nothing really eats them because they're so low in any kind of nutrient content and very, very high in tannins. And unfortunately, it seems as though the elephants are desperate enough now in this drought and in the dry season to actually want to try and feed and get whatever nutrients they can from those as well. Okay, let's try and reposition now. Get a little bit closer. These elephants are moving actually quite a lot faster than I thought they were. And it's one of the reasons why we're very careful with our elephants at the moment. They're not necessarily in the best of moods because they're tired. They have to walk constantly to try and find the nutrients that they need to sustain their enormous size and to try and get to water. Luckily it's not too hot just yet. I'm going to stop here just so I don't scare the little one. Welcome Lauren to our sunrise safari. It's lovely to have you on board. And Lauren's asked a question that we often get asked, especially if we ever see an injured animal, which is do we ever help the elephants or the big cats if they get injured or sick in some way? Oh, mommy, mommy, wait. <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait for me. Um, Lauren, it depends. It depends on what's caused the injury and the illness. If it is, oh, little head shake. If it is an injury that's been induced by humans, let's say, and it's very, very unlikely here where we are in the Sabi sand, because the Sabi sand is well monitored and maintained, and the, patrolled as well along the fence lines. But if, for example, we found an elephant with, heaven forbid, a bullet hole in it, or a snare around its trunk, then absolutely we would intervene, because that is a human-induced injury. If it is a big cat or an elephant that it has been injured in some kind of natural way and unfortunately no we don't and it's it stems back to many many years of experience in terms of conservation and the size of this area so as much as we want to letting nature take its course is one of the best ways to actually manage an enormous area like this because in turn nature actually manages itself too many elephants is a bad thing because they shape the landscape and there's not enough food to sustain them. Too many cats is equally a bad thing. If you've got too many lions, your wild dog population suffers, your leopards, your cheetah, all of the other predators as well as your general game species. So if it is a natural, some kind of natural injury, then we do, we leave it for nature to take its course. It depends though upon where you are. In the, in the greater Kruger National Park area, because this place is so enormous, then that is the reason that we we let it manage itself. If it's a much smaller area, then there might be there might be more justification for interfering in some way. I'm going to try and keep up with these Elias before they cross into Simbombili, although I think they're going to disappear on us. Let's go across to Brent and Tingana before he does something similar. Yeah, we're still staying with him. He's going through these monkey orange thickets at the moment, heading straight straight to the west or southwest oh there you go, scent marking yeah, now if you're wondering about this big male leopard and what he's up to, where he's going uh, send me a question, questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Oh, he's going into a particularly thick area now, but we will try to stay with him. Now, he's marching and he's spraying urine on bushes as he goes. Now, it's a wonderful smell, leopard urine, and I think a lot of you are going to go, oh, gross, how can you say that? Well, it smells like buttered popcorn. And I'm just trying to figure out where he's going to pop out now. There he is. And so he stops, he listens. There's quite a stiff breeze for early morning, which is a nice thing for him if he's hunting.
attacks uh, keep coming southwest. Yeah, is if you if you switch off your hear my audio, I don't know if how far I am from Triple M at the moment. So he's taken us through one art fark oh, and another art fark central. There are lots of holes and we're going to be able to nip through them without falling in. Here's the next question. Now he's certainly on a mission and male leopards are very good at missioning. A male leopard can easily walk 10 or 12 kilometers on his nightly patrols. Well, a huge safari live welcome to William, a new viewer who would like to know how dangerous this situation is. Not at all, William, as long as we drive respectfully and carefully around him and don't put him in any pressure or corner him, he will continue moving as if we weren't even here. Taxi, I'm straight south from you now. I'm straight south. I don't know if you can see a big Shadulu. I'm just on the other side of that Shadulu. He's now heading a little bit more south. Okay, I'm going to try to keep up with him. And say he's taking us on an adventure through the area that's got the least roads in the whole of Juma. Morning, Shelly. Shelly's wondering. Oh, that's not. That's a car killer. We're not going to get over that one. Is Tingana? Shelly's wondering: Is Tingana hunting a leopardess uh, to steal her kill? Well, if he happens to come across a leopardess who's got a kill, he will steal it. But at the moment, I would say he's on territorial patrol. Keeping moving, keeping moving, keeping us on our toes. Okay, so I'm going to a patch of quite serious bush and holes. So I need to concentrate. So while I concentrate, let's go back and see how Jamie's doing. So while Brent gets through some thick vegetation and hopefully manages to stay with Tingana, we're heading to the northern side of Juma to go and see if we can't follow up on those Inkuhumas and their lovely little cubs. Try and figure out exactly where they've gone. I've got fresh, fresh tracks of, the ma of a male lion and I'm almost certain that he is the one responsible for those alarm calls that I said I heard that put me in the wrong direction in terms of trying to find Tingana. I think this male lion walked straight past us and we must have just narrowly missed him by a bit of a margin. It looks like he's going towards Simbombili, so for now we're going to go look for the Inkahumas. And if we don't have any luck there, then we'll head back in this direction and see if we can't follow up. I'm reverse tracking him for now, just in case he was with the Inkahumas last night. And that he might lead us, his tracks might lead us backwards to wherever they are. And speaking of our little lion cubs, Barbara in Tampa, the only update I can give you is that that little lion cub is going to be absolutely fine. 
So Barbara was very concerned about our limpy lion cub that had a, quite a, I think it was a hip injury more than a leg injury. The, 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 its whole hips were slightly off center and it was limping very very badly at one point. It is now seems to be so much better playing, full of energy, not quite fully up to, not fully healed, still struggling to keep up a little bit but the nice thing of course about being a lion cub is that the whole pride will stop and wait for it. Mom will wait, little siblings will wait and they'll wait for it to catch up every time they move and it seems the rate that it's healing I think it's going, I mean we said at the time it was probably going to be absolutely fine and it definitely that seems to be the case. So positive news on, in terms of our little lion cub with its limp and that is one of the Inkuhuma cubs not one of the Styx cubs. The Styx cubs have their own different kettle of problems which is the skin infection that they have whether it is mange or whether it is some kind of fungal infection there's a bit of debate about that but those they'll also they will grow out of that at some point hopefully okay the elephants by the way raced onto Simbambili in the time it would have taken me to get around and onto our boundary they were already on the other side of the road and moving off so they were clearly on a mission and I think they were running now in hindsight because a male lion walked right past them. That I think is what caused their distress. Let's just check up on Sydney's dam since it is one of the big permanent water sources around here and our lions do enjoy it and of course there's always the mystery wild dogs, the lower sabi pack that also spend a bit of time here. any lions doesn't look like it something that looks like a water buck standing on the dam wall itself There's some water buck there some impala as well water buck racing up towards the impala. Oh no, it's another water buck. The light, the red light tricked me. Oh, the light is so beautiful. Let's continue on our lion search and leave Sydney's dam, but we don't want to spend too long away from Mr. Tingana. Let's go back to him. So we're coming quite close to the boundary with Arethusa at the moment and aren't we lucky? We're going to follow him across that boundary and I'll need to figure out our next move. Okay, I'm just concentrating, I'm trying to find a spot through here. He is giving us a good workout this morning. You can see my arms as we twist around the different obstacles. Hi, Tasha. Oh, oh, oh. Now Tasha's wondering, how long does it take a leopard to patrol their territory? Well, it completely depends uh, on the leopard. So Tingana's actually got one of the biggest territories in the whole Sabi Sands, um, probably uh, close on three or 4,000 hectares. He can probably patrol it in two or three days if he's walking like he is at the moment. Normally, he'll take about a week. Now, other leopards that live further south in the Sabi Sands along the Sand River have much smaller territories around a thousand hectares because the prey and female density is higher along the rivers. Oh look at this is going to be beautiful Brian. There we go we've got the rising sun we've got our dominant male leopard isn't this just exquisite. I hope you guys are getting some fantastic screenshots. Oh, there he goes, he's going to lie down. It's 
So if you hear that clickety click, that's just me getting a few pictures. Here we go, time for some preening. Now, Michael's wondering why male leopards don't form coalitions like male lions. Now, Michael, it's very simple. Uh, leopards are designed to be solitary animals. And uh, for them, there's far more benefit in being alone and having multiple females just to themselves and defending a territory than being in a coalition. They'd have to share food. They don't need an area as big as lions. So they don't need as much food as a lion. So there's no real evolutionary benefit for leopards to become social. Also, their hunting strategy is an, as an ambush predator. Lions are also ambush predators, but less so than, than leopards. Um, because lions hunt big things like buffalo and, and hippopotamus. Where if you've been spotted, it's not, not too much the worst thing. It's more of a war of attrition. That, oh, look at that incredible light coming through. He's up and mobile again. So he's going to walk right into the light. Get ready with the screenshots. I um, can't resist but snap a few pictures. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. This is going to pass about four feet from the front of our car. Okay, so he's coming up to our western boundary. I'm just going to let taxi go in front of us because we can follow across to Arethusa and tax can't. Now he has taken us through some incredibly difficult areas and he's going to do the same on Arethusa if he crosses straight to the west, which it looks like he's going to. Just waiting to see what he does. Stations Tangana has now crossed into Arethusa. He is mobile south parallel to Gauri Main, uh, about 100 meters to the west of Zebra Drive. Uh, best access still Gauri Main um, or Zebra Drive. One station here. He's going to go back into quite a thick area that we're going to have to zig and zag through. So we're going to stick with him. Maybe he's going to lead us to some ladies. So while we watch him disappear, let's go back to Jamie. Speaking of Tingana and finding ladies, we found some very, very interesting tracks in the road. Something I did not expect to see. However, it is very interesting. What's even more interesting is the fact that Tingana has been around and probably listening to this. 
Look at this. Let me jump out to show you what you're looking at here. I've been following them since Sydney's dam. And I say them. There's two leopards. It's a male and a female. The male, let me just not mess this up. So the male's footprints are here. Huge feet moving along here. The female's tracks come in from the opposite direction. And all of this here, the sweeps in the ground, the sort of places where the soil's been disturbed, that tells me something very interesting. And that is that the female came up to the male, she seduced him somewhere around here, and they mated right here on this road. And these tracks are fresh. Nobody's driven over them yet, which is a very, very good sign. The question is, where have they gone from here? Because it looks as though the female moved away from him towards Buffel's Hook. Her last track is stepped on. Bravo, Jamie. Her last track heads in this direction <laughs> towards Buffel's Hook. But the female follows the male whenever a female is in estrus. And what's really nice about mating leopards, if they're still in the area, we should hear them. That brrrr sound. So, Mbula, probably, because if it were Tingana, Tingana would still be with his lady friend. That's most likely Mbula. How did Tingana not hear what was going on, or did he hear what was going on? Perhaps that's why he was so vocal early this morning. And I'm really hoping, because at this time of morning it's nice and cool, I'm really hoping that these leopards give us a clue as to where they are. And I'm talking about the sounds of their mating. It's very aggressive and it's very noisy. We've heard that Mvula's been mating in Buffel's Hook, probably with Shaluba. Let's just go a little way ahead to check and make sure that they didn't pop out further, because he did seem to be on a bit of a mission. My gut instinct says that Mvula might have decided to go further north, back into Buffel's Hook, away from Tingana's calls. But you've got to be careful of that. Because just because, yep, she came out here. Just because that's what I would do if I were Mvula doesn't mean that's what he did. And he hasn't, or he has. Oh goodness, it's all very confusing. They've been backwards and forwards along this road. Leopard tracks everywhere. It might also be the new female leopard that Brent had a little while ago on one of our live drives. Sorry, just going to show you those tracks for one second. And Virginia, good morning to you. You wanted to know if that female leopard is still in the area? No. Well, maybe. <laughs> she might have come back. But that afternoon, Brent tracked her onto Simbambili. I'm going to be following our leopard tracks. In the meantime, Brent's got one thing better than leopard tracks, fresh leopard tracks, which is the actual leopard. Let's go back to Tingana. So he's still mobile south and... Fortunately for us, he's heading towards a road, so... Well, he's just crossed a road, but now he's going to head towards another one, which makes of course makes our life a little bit easier. Not so much bashing and crashing. And I know how Brian absolutely loves to follow a leopard parallel to us while we're moving. Let's hope he sticks parallel. I've got a feeling he might pop out in front of us. There he is. Has he heard something or seen something? There we go, we're going to spray. And we get to have the lovely wafting buttered popcorn. Boy, he's now on Zebra Drive heading south. Now Cheryl's wondering, are leopards better at dealing with the heat than lions, or is it the same? Cheryl, they're a little bit better, and that's purely just because of their size. Uh, they're a little bit smaller. So, 
less area to get hot, but that is the main reason why they are better at dealing with the heat. You're going to go take us into the next big block, big boy. And we're just going to zoop around in front of him again. I think we're going to get some nice, get ready for some good screenshots. Is he... oh, he's just about the wrong bush. Um, Cheryl's wondering, are they used to the guide smell or just used to the safari vehicles? Here we go, get ready. Look at that. Lovely backlighting from the early morning. Now, I think they're just used to the safari vehicles. You can see there, he is two feet. He's so close, we can't even see him when he walks in front of us. Look at that, you can see that massive neck of a male leopard. And Brendan, who's a new viewer, welcome Brendan, who's in Canberra, the capital of Australia. And Brendan's wondering, oh, hang on, look at his ears moving. I've suddenly drawn a complete blank, what Brendan in Canberra was asking. Ah, what does Tingana's name mean? So it means shy. So when he first came into this area, he was a little bit nervous around the vehicles. But if, as you drive, respectfully, you can, they become very used to the vehicles. Uh, we track the leopards on foot as well quite often. Okay, there he goes. We're going to stick with him. Now he's heading down towards the southern edge of his territory where there's another male, a big male called the Anderson male. There he is in that beautiful golden morning light. Now, Shamsung's wondering, would the black spots help with reflecting heat? Uh, no, they wouldn't. If anything, black actually draws in heat. Uh, and that's why you'll notice when they're really hot, they lie with their legs open to expose the white. White helps to dispel heat. But the, the black spots are there for camouflage. He might climb this big termite mound up ahead. And he's going to stop for a quick scent mark. Let's just see. I want, before I move, I want to see if he's going to go to the left or the right of the termite mound. Looks like left, which means we've got to change our route. Okay, well, we try to get round to the other side of him. Let's go see what Jamie's up to. Well, Brent moves around for a different view of Tingana. We are still on the tracks of our mating leopards. And I'm trying to puzzle in my, out in my head exactly what would have happened last night. There is a possibility that Tingana met up with a female. That's why I'm trying to work out exactly where these tracks go. But Tingana met up with a female for a while. 
she wasn't in the estrus and then he moved off and that's the tracks that we're following. But the tracks for me look a little bit too small, difficult to tell though and I don't claim to be able to identify our individual leopards by their track size. But my instinct says that the tracks are a little bit small plus the fact that Mula was seen mating on Buffel's hook. And all of those start to stack up in favor of Mbula mating with a leopard, some, with a female somewhere here. The question is, Tingana would have heard it and he wouldn't have been terribly impressed. So what would Mbula have done about that? Because one thing we know from when Mbula had his scrap with Gijima, when he was mating with Shaluva. So now, we, now we're throwing names out there. It gets very confusing. Let me try and explain this clearly. Tinga, uh, Mbula is a male leopard. So is Gijima. There we go, so let's clarify that. Mvula is an older male leopard, and he was mating with a female when one, a younger male that is very, very skittish came onto the scene and chased Mvula away. Mvula was then seen mating with that female just a few hours after that. Now, I'm, in my own head, I'm sure that Mvula would rather actually have avoided her for the time being, so as not to attract trouble. However, the females are, female leopards, when they're in estrus, are very, very, very determined. I don't know if there's any other way to phrase it. They are saying no to them is a difficult thing for a male leopard and he can't, there's no way that Mvula could be sneaky about this. So did he run back towards Buffel's hook or are they here somewhere? Still have their tracks. So it was yours who called in the fact that it Mvula was mating yesterday in Buffel's hook. I've also got good news, but we'll come back to this in a moment, and that's the fact that there are hyena tracks everywhere around Gallagher Shortcut. Could it be that our hyena clan has decided to come back to us? I'll check that a bit later once we've looked for these leopards. I feel like I should have heard them by now, which is what's making me worry that Mvula might have decided to start running away from the sound of Tingana sawing. Speaking of Tingana, he is doing his dominant male leopard thing and looking beautiful and magnificent on a termite mound, so let's go and have a look. So here we go, he's... There he is, look at that, squirrels just spotted him. No squirrels. Alarm calling. Leopard, 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 leopard. Isn't that stunning? Big male leopard in the early morning light. Oh, look at those eyes. I hear yeah, the very, very loud crested barbed calling as well. Sarah in Oregon is wondering, as leopards get older, do they lose some of their senses like hearing, smell and eyesight? Most definitely they do. And that's how often they get caught by lions or hyenas as they're, when they're older males. And they don't quite have the, the senses that they did when they were younger. Very loud crested barbet. Look at that wonderful little shine on his eye from the early morning. So he's walked quite a long distance. I mean, I've been hearing him since about four o'clock this morning. Oh, it's tired, Kitty. And I'd say he's probably walked seven or eight k's since the first rasping call I heard in the early morning.
Do you want me to fumble forward a bit so you can fit in behind that? So Roy from Arethusa has arrived to enjoy this wonderful leopard sighting with us. Now, Les in New York is wondering whether male leopards just pee sometimes or do they save all their urine for scent marking. Um, if they're around a carcass, a kill, they will sometimes just pee, but mostly if they're not static on a carcass, they will save their urine for scent marking. And they, they let it out in short little sprays. It's absolutely stunning. And you can see he's got some ticks on his nose. Now, Jared's wondering, do we know where Tingana came from and did he have any litter mates? Jared, we're not sure. He's one of the male leopards who sort of just appeared. So, which more likely he means he came from a very thick area with not too many roads called Ottawa, which is to the west of us. That's most likely where he came from, but we can't be sure. Here we go, having a good snooze on top of the termite mound. We're going to stay here as long as we can. There are some other people who are wanting to come have a look at him. And we've had a really majestic view of him so far moving. And now sitting atop a termite mound. So it's quite likely, unless something stumbles upon him in Impala or in Nyala during the day, he's probably going to be snoozing around this area for the rest of the day. As I said, it looks like he has eaten. He doesn't have the most full belly, but he's definitely not starving at the moment. And his limp is looking much better than the last time I saw him. Now Lucy in South Bend, Indiana is wondering, do male leopards soar more than female leopards? Uh, they do, generally. So they're far more aggressive in their defensive territories. Now the main reason for this is because female leopards normally sequester a section of their territory to one of their daughters. So it's, it's more often that the, a female leopard, is sur her territories are surrounded by her daughters. Now, if we look at Karula, for example, she's got Shadow to the west of her and she's got Tandi um, to the east of her. So two of those territories, she probably doesn't patrol as heavily because there are relatives of hers. Whereas he has no relatives in this area, apart from, of course, possibly some of the current offspring uh, of Karula, Tandi and Shadow. But it's very difficult uh, to say for sure that he's the dad without genetics, because female leopards will mate with multiple males to ensure any male that they might come across uh, is, is under the impression that they're the father. Justin saying he hopes there's enough land for when Hasana, Karuda's current cub, the male cub starts looking for territory. Well, Justin, what will normally happen in those cases is he will leave his natal or his mother's territory. He'll be chased by his mom and, and probably Tingana, and he will probably end up having territory outside of an area we have traverse in. Now, the reason for this is to stop inbreeding. Even though big cats can inbreed for up to six generations without any adverse effects, if you, they keep inbreeding, obviously, certain negative uh, genetic traits might start coming through but so Hassan is after about the age of three years old we're unlikely to see him on Safari Live anymore. Now, 
Now, I haven't seen Tingana in quite a while. Jamie seems to have had all the Tingana luck over the last month or so. Uh, quite excited that we managed to find him. And I always love tracking animals by their calls. So guessing where he was calling from and guessing where he might appear is always fun. And this morning the killer bees were spot on. Penny Pines wondering, is he on top of this termite mound for warmth? I would say more from a vantage point, Penny. It's not an active termite mound, so there are no uh, currently open chimneys that are exuding warm air, and it's not that cold this morning compared to what it has been over the last while. I think there's some warthog holes there, and he is a great lover of warthogs and artfarks, both hole dwellers. And the only artfark I've seen in the last year here has been up a tree with him eating it. William, who's a new viewer, is wondering how high do leopards normally jump? Like he can probably jump about vertically, probably two meters, two and a half meters, and uh, parallel, probably five meters. It all depends on the situation. If there's a male lion behind him, you probably find he can stretch his vertical jump to about three. Or hyena, it all just depends on the, the individual situation. But they are incredibly incredible athletes for big cats. They're able to show incredible dexterity and versatility up in the boughs of trees. And now he's got a very irritating little bird that I noticed land next to him. He's going to shout at him. A little rattling sister here. Beep, 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 beep. Brian spotted the crested barbet that was making an incredible noise earlier, basking in the top of that knobthorn tree. Oh. And we can still hear those testiculars. Oh, there's a pair of crested barbets. Now, the testiculars are in the little quarry bush to the right of him. So uh, see him there Brian? Zoom, center, almost dead center frame. A little bit further to the right, up a little bit. There we go, center. There we go, there's the little rattling cysticula. He's unimpressed at having a leopard on its termite mound. So when you are tracking leopards, when you haven't found them, even a little distress call from a tiny little cysticula can often lead you into the right spot. So if you've heard impala or kudu alarm calling and you know they're in the area and you suddenly hear cysticulas or even fire finches alarming, it's always worth double checking. best to ignore them. Now a lot of you since it's Sunday morning can probably imagine you've got those noisy neighbors for banging or doing DIY. Now that's the male leopard's equivalent of the noisy neighbor on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Who's coming right? No standbys. I've the thread is too much talk. <laughs> yeah, they're near Buffalo's boundary. Eight. 
Um, I think only three, my daughters. Yeah, not like sticks. Was it six? <laughs> So just chatting with Roy, I've turned my game drive comms off. I'm making sure that we're not holding up a, a long queue for this leopard because we have spent a long time with him. We're not at the moment. Isn't that just beautiful? And you can see even though his eyes are tightly shut, his ears are still working, scanning, listening carefully. You can see how tatty his ears are, and those are mostly from biting flies. Uh, good morning, Ruth, who's in South Africa. Ruth would like to know who names the leopards that come into our Travers area. Well, it all depends with cubs. All the head rangers get together, we put forward a, a bunch of names and then it's voted on on which names are chosen. Now, with male leopards, it's normally that just arrive in an area like this, it'll be the property that he's first seen on those ranges. We'll normally name, name them. Um, or if it's a male leopard that's known, say from Malamala or Lonlozi and they move into our area, we'll just take the name that they were already called. Not Elvis. Yeah, Here we go, heads up. <laughs> yeah, my ganga. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, there are some vehicles wanting to come in here now. So let's go back to Jamie. We're going to stay here for a few more minutes. We might have one last look at this gorgeous male leopard before I think I'm going to head down to the, the east and try find the Styx Pride. And in a tragic tale of woe, I have tracked our leopards all the way to Tambuti Dam. And as I stopped to get out and look at their tracks, I heard the mating. Now, unfortunately, I've heard the mating on Buffelshook which is a place to the north of our boundary where we cannot go. So I have set other vehicles off in the right direction. Bernie's on his way now, he's just approaching us this way and I'm going to tell him where I heard them and then off we go to search for other things and I'm going to try and hold back the tears. Okay, so for new viewers, there's certain places we can go, there's certain places we can't, there's certain places other vehicles go, there's certain places they can't. And Buffel's Hook, unfortunately, to the north of our boundary, is one such spot. So Mvula is there, I think, mating with Shaluva, but the younger Shaluva, not the older Shaluva. I'm just going to help Bernie out for one second. Good morning. Good, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, there's that road that runs just west. I think if you go up there, you should hear them. I, I might have walked a little bit just to see where they popped out. Um, Thanks very much. Um, and then I heard the mating, probably maybe a hundred or so meters in. He might be moving away from Tingana because Tingana has been shouting all night. Oh really? Yeah. Okay, cool. He's on Arathusa now. Thank you now. very much. It's a pleasure. Enjoy. <laughs> Have fun. Cheers guys. I'm going to go find the lions. Hi. Bernie of course can go on to Buffelswick and he's a lovely gentleman. And Aubrey wants to know why we never cross over the boundaries and what would happen if we did. Big trouble. No, I'm joking. Um, it's a very sensitive matter because it involves not over-utilizing certain parts of the land. That's one of the big reasons why we have such rules about where certain vehicles can go and can't go because you don't want everybody driving in exactly the same place. Pressure on the animals, pressure on the sighting, pressure on the environment. It also has to do with uh, other concerns. I'll tell you what would happen, Aubrey, if we went onto Buffelshook, is we would lose signal because we've got repeaters set up in the places that we can go. So if I went onto Buffelshook now, um, perhaps Jerry, Zander, and myself would have a lovely sighting 
of the mating leopards but we wouldn't be able to show it to you anyway. Uh, there's lots of different reasons behind it, um, several that are far above my head and above my pay grade but we can't we can't go into Buffel's Hook and it would be breaking it would be breaking contracts and rules that we have signed if we just don't do it. Um, as I said to Bernie now, I might have taken a little stroll, but very, I mean, you know, 10 meters onto Buffel's Hook, not far, and it was purely, Taina, it was purely to help Bernie try and track down those leopards, to just figure out exactly where they went. <sighs> and it happens, but sometimes it works the other way around. Sometimes the animals come to us and the other vehicles can't cross. The, the, the various game drive vehicles in the West have been bemoaning the fact that the Inkahumas have been spending so much time with us because they can't come on to Juma to come and have a look at them. So they still haven't seen the little cubs that the Inkahumas have with them. Oh no, they have. They have once on a buffalo kill many, many weeks ago. So it's, sometimes it works in our favor. It all balances out in the end. <laughs> There's nothing like the feeling of tracking something for a good hour before it goes off, but that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Could just have easily have come onto here, and the reason I think he went that side is because Tingana came onto Juma and started calling. And I'm glad that at least we got proof that that was what had happened, and that Mvula showed some sense in booking straight out to the north. Now I'm just going to keep my game drive channel on so I can hear when Bernie finds them. He should find them. At least we know we were on the right track, and at least we heard them towards the end. Let's go find some lions, shall we? And Jenny in Cape Town, lovely to have you on board. A fellow South African joining us on our live safaris. Yes, we do see the smaller cats. Well, we've seen serval a couple of times, and in fact, I had an amazing sighting of a serval eating something. We never fully clarified exactly what it was chewing on, but I think it was a scrub here. Sorry, hold on Jenny, one second. Standing by. Uh, just to uh, clarify, do you think those uh, I mean, we were west of this road that gets north past the uh, Tumbuti Dam? Affirmative, I think so. I marked where his tracks went off the road and then I heard audio. It sounded to the northwest of Tambuati Dam. I don't know those roads very well at all. Thank you. Good luck. Uh, Bernie, you didn't drive Gary Cutline, did you? No, I didn't go down Gary Cutline. Copy that, thank you. Sorry, Jenny, just helping yeah, Bernie out a little bit more. Oh, goodness me. Poor Jenny has to wait for. I'll just tell Brent to hold on. I stand by one. So poor Jenny's trying to find out about small cats. We've had lots of serval sightings, really, really nice. We probably get one every roughly every two months or so. Then we also see we've seen an African wildcat. I've seen one once. They're a little bit rarer to see. Caracal is still on our list. Now I've heard tell that there are lots of caracal, or at least one relaxed caracal on the Simbombili fence line, which means that we could see one perhaps on our live safaris, but we haven't seen one yet and I'm really excited, that's the one I want to tick off the list next. Oh goodness. Poor Brent, he was trying to talk to me but now he can't, he's lost his chance. Negative Okay, I'm going to let Brent tell you what's on Arathus actually. Brent standing by. There's their tracks, there's the lion's tracks, this is good. Please don't go off our property as well. Brent, Brent. Oh well, moving on, let's go and find these lions. So the lioness has been keeping her cubs, <coughs> cubs in a drainage system, in a, so basically in a river system, just to the east of this road. We've known that they've, uh, there we go, 
Standing by. Brent again, sorry. I did copy that, thank you. I'm going to be following up on Nkuhumas. Copy, there's standby number nine there, so I'm going to come back to where. <laughs> copy. Remember what we were talking about, about um, the fact that they were bemoaning the fact that the Nkuhumas and therefore the Birmingham boys are spending so much time on our side? Well, the Birmingham boys, three of them, including the one that we had tracks for, by the way, at the start of the Sunrise Safari, they're on Arethusa. And what Brent was laughing about there, which you may have heard through, my, through the game drive comms, is the fact that there is a, a ninth standby available, which means there are 12 vehicles ultimately that will go through that sighting before you get to go and see them. So he's going to make his way back towards Juma, for now. And hope that by the end of the Sunrise Safari, perhaps he'll be able to jump on board with that. But of course, for those vehicles, their guests haven't seen male lions yet, so it's really, really exciting for them. And we have. We've been spoiled with male lion sightings. So again, it's just the way the cookie crumbles. Let's go find the Nkuhumas instead and have them all to ourselves. How does that sound? Very nice in theory. And speaking of Brent, I'm sure he'd like to tell you a little bit about what's happening there. Now let's jump on the back of Rusty with him. So wasn't that absolutely brilliant being able to spend all that time with Mr. T, the dominant male leopard, as he traversed through Juma onto Arethusa. He's now snoozing happily atop a termitaria. So I know Jamie is looking for the Inkahumas. Three Birmingham boys have been found on Arethusa, but there are um, a lot of vehicles waiting to get in there. And so we're not gonna, we might head that way a little later once it, the sighting calms down, but they are, flat cats at the moment sleeping so i think we're gonna do oh african harrier hawk now they're really interesting birds let me try forward a bit brian on, let's just try to sneak past the sticks Here's our little window of opportunity. I don't know how good it is, but we'll take it. So an incredible bird of prey. And they're able, able to dislocate their joints so they can put their feet down holes to take baby birds, baby squirrels, and all sorts of other creatures. Unfortunately, he is quite far from the road. And can't really see him, so we'll leave him be. Did you hear a snort? Did you hear a snort, Brian? Ah, no, it was the lilac-breasted roller. When the, vehicle, when the car is on, sometimes the lilac-breasted roller call close by can sound like an alarm call. Where is that noisy creature? Sounded like he wasn't too far away. Now, he was probably shouting at the fact that that Harrier Hawk is around. Now, rollers are hole nesters, so they nest in holes and dead trees. So it is one of the things that the Harrier Hawk might be looking for, a baby roller for breakfast. But lilac-breasted rollers can be very aggressive in the defense of their nests. And they do have quite powerfully sharp bills. So they are very capable of attacking a bigger bird because they are more maneuverable. Now, I heard over the radio a bit earlier that there might be sticks on Cheetah Plains, but I'm trying to get an update. Hi, Dagan in Kansas City. Now, Dagan's wondering, are there any gorillas on the reserve? Uh, no, Dagan, what we're in here is quite an arid area, uh, so quite dry. Uh, gorillas are a rainforest or high rainfall area.
Yeah. You have three types of gorillas. You have the western lowland gorillas that live in the Congo Basin rainforests. Then you have the mountain gorillas that are confined to the Volcanoes National Park between Congo, Rwanda and uh, Uganda. And then you have the Cross River gorillas that live in a very small area between the River Cross and uh, the Congo River, also in the Congo Basin rainforest. So the, first, the closest gorilla to us is over 2,000 kilometers away. Now we have, as Safari Live, been up there recently. We did try to broadcast live from high in the Virungu Mountains, but unfortunately it didn't quite work. But if you look on our Facebook page, there is a little video of that incredible experience. And of course, Dagan, if you're not sure what the Facebook page is, it is Safari Live. Now, speaking of Safari Live, if you put a hashtag in front of that Safari Live, like Dagan probably has, uh, you can ask us questions while we're out in the middle of the African bush, or you can send us an email on questions at wildearth.tv. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give Jamie a little hand. I'm going to check a little bit further to the south, see if the Nkuma's maybe changed direction. If we get no luck there, I'm gonna still going to keep trying to get hold of it. Andrew or Ephraim from Cheetah Plains uh, and see if the sticks are down there. If they are, we might take a little trundle down to the east. Now, Mobile Paddy is wondering what the guides from the other lodges think of Safari Live. Well, I, well, the ones that I know what they think, they quite like us. We're quite good friends with quite a few of the other guides. And um, outside of drive time, we do socialize together. We, we shisanyama, we burn meat, or have a braai or a barbecue. So I think we're quite well liked, Paddy. Yeah, while well, we head off a little bit further to the southeast, let's go see how Jamie's search for the Nkuhumas in the north is going. The search is going well. I'm slowly building up a little bit of a pattern in my own head as to what happened last night. And I've got the tracks of the female with her new babies, and I know it's her the new babies because their tracks are absolutely minuscule. They are so, so tiny. So I definitely know that it's her and not the other cubs that we're tracking. And what I'm doing now, because I don't have a direction yet, is I'm checking all of their favorite roads and basically by process of elimination, trying to figure out exactly where they went last night. Now we've already know that they didn't go west because that's where we started checking for Tingana. And so far it doesn't look as though they've come north which leaves south and east and I've sort of semi checked east I'm going to have to go and double check the eastern direction and that's basically how one goes about searching for lions when you don't have if we've got them roaring then it's nice and easy then we know that that's the direction we start to head in if we don't then things become a little bit more tricky but we've already got a, a more of a hint than we might otherwise have because we know that they were all all five plus eight cubs were drinking at the Juma Dam camera last night at about one o'clock in the morning. And hopefully we're going to find them somewhere, possibly on a nice big buffalo kill, so that we can spend time with them over the next few days. And Michael, another lovely question from you, which is when will the females come back into Estrus once when with the the, the there, sorry, let's try not to mangle poor Michael's question. When will the cubs be old enough for their mothers to come back into Estrus? It is between a year and a half and two years old. So it depends just like with all mammals, each and every single individual is different and it depends upon the individual concerned. Can we just check the hyena den since we're here? Might as well. And I have been promising that I'm checking all of the den sites and I'm here now. 
so Michael, they will be ooh, roughly about a year and a half, usually closer to two in my experience in this area, that the females start to mate again. Which does put their cubs roughly in sort of that independence age. What was so, so unfortunate about the timing of the Birmingham boy takeover, at least for the Inkahumas, was their youngest members, which includes the youngest female, that, the youngest adult female that we now have, they were so close to reaching that age where they would, their mother and they would start going back into estrus. And yet, it was just this really unfortunate thing that the Birmingham boys ended up killing one of the Nkahuma sub-adults, the female. And she was the female with the amber eyes. She'd inherited the amber-eyed gene. There's, there were two of them, they were twins. And we, the last time we saw them happily playing together in the drainage line, and then we got a tragic report from Simbombili that the Birmingham boys had killed one of them. It was just, just at the cusp of being safe being in a safe age. And as a result, we actually think that's why so many of the Yunkuhuma females lost their lives as well. Just trying to defend those young females and junior. There's something very sad. It's just that, that little bit too, too early. <clears throat> what females with young cubs will do though, is they will pretend to be an estrus. And it's not quite a false estrus either because a false estrus comes as soon as males have killed their cubs then they go in straight into false estrus but females with existing young cubs will pretend to be an estrus <clears throat> and attempt to mate with the males which is difficult because obviously they have but they have the advantage of the lactation hormones helping to fool the males and they'll do that to try and if the cubs are young enough they'll mate with the males to try and convince them that the, those cubs are theirs Speaking of cubs, is anybody home at the hyena den? Drum roll. And no. Unfortunately not. It's also a good spot to look for the lions. I think that's why they've abandoned this den site, as this is where the lions have been spending a great deal of their time. I love this den with its tamburti shade. It's beautiful. So this is an old hyena den for viewers that have only joined us in the last month in the time that our hyena f clan abandoned us and went further to the north. This is an old hyena den. We've had many magical moments spent on our live safaris. Just sitting here watching the cubs fall over each other, chew on the branches, go into one hole and emerge out of another, tumble around, getting brave enough to come up to the vehicles to sniff the tires. I'm feeling very nostalgic. I do wish they'd come back. They will, of course, but it's it's one of those things. Again, cookie, the way the cookie crumbles out here. We've got in Kuhumas and their cubs, and as a result, we don't have any hyenas at the moment. Nope. All is quiet. And often you'll see fresh signs if the cubs had moved back here. We'd see fresh scuffs in the dirt. There are scuffs in the dirt, but I think they're probably more likely made by Franklin than anything else and you'd see freshly chewed sticks, maybe even bits of bone. Okay, well it was worth a try. Let's go and look for the Nkuhumas. Watch heads. Here we go. Now we're driving on an established two track that leads to the hyena den, but this is a road that has been made by us to get to the hyena den from the actual road itself. Now what we're doing at the moment, um, especially because of the drought, one of the reasons why we couldn't follow up on those elephants this morning is we are only off-roading for cats and dogs and that's it actually cats and dogs and Roxanne would like to know if we're doing major da if we do damage to the bush with the vehicles we do do damage to the bush with the vehicles however we 
You know, when you see the trees being knocked over, just have a look at what a place looks like after an elephant herd has been through it. And you'll get an idea of just how much more damage they do than we do. And we pick the species of trees that we go through very, very carefully. The young trees that are going to spring back up or species that are bush encroaches. And we try and make sure that we do it very ethically. If, for example, it has rained, there are certain places where we won't off-road because we will do some serious damage to seep lines. Um, sodic sites, we never drive over. Sodic site is where there's no vegetation because there's a very high sodium content in the soil. We won't drive there. But we're very, very careful about where we drive. There are strict policies about it and what trees we drive over. Uh, in terms of our impact, I would say it is negligible compared to what an elephant... I mean, if we stop... Yeah, let's just stop here. Have a look at here, the trees. <laughs> you know, you can just keep going. And there's f felled trees all over the show that have been damaged by an elephant herd. So in terms of our impact on trees, it is negligible. Our impact on soil is a different thing because when we drive over the soil, we compact it. That in turn can lead to erosion if it's not done carefully, which is why when you watch us go off road to an established sighting, even if it looks like there's a really easy way for us to go, we follow established tracks, we follow established roads, so that we minimize that impact on the soil. And one of the things we are doing, because there's minimal grass cover at the moment, is we're not off-roading unless it is for cats and for dogs. Let's jump over onto the back of Rusty with Brent to find out what he's up to. I'm also going to try and contact him on the Game Drive channel, but for now I'll send you back over to him. So, uh, we're going to leave, we were going to go help Jamie, we decided to leave her for a little bit uh, on that lion search and just have a quick look for the Queen Karula. So if there are new viewers there, we've seen Tengana on the leopard dynamics on Juma. He's sort of the king of Juma, uh, if you're a leopard. Now we're looking for the queen, the dominant female in the area. And she's got two cubs at the moment. Um, and they're about, I think, seven months old now. Six months, six months, might be close to seven months now. And we're going to go see if she's maybe come back into the area. No, seven months next month. It was six months on the 2nd of August. So, and they are named Hosanna, which is Little Prince, and Shongile, most exquisitely beautiful. Hi, Lynn, who's in the UK. Now, Lynn's wondering if Tingana met Karula and Cubs, is he a threat to the Cubs? Uh, he's not. We've actually had Tingana, Karula and both cubs in the same sighting. And so he's convinced he's the baby daddy. So he's not a threat. Uh, it's possible if the cubs tried to share a kill with them or something, he might swat them. And because he's such a big male, it, it, it might danger them, it hurt them. But we noticed when Hosanna tried to come to him while he was eating the impala he stole from Karula, one big snarl was enough to send him back another 10 meters and away from him. So I'm not an outward threat. A bigger threat to those cubs are, are, dis, are dispersal males. So young male leopards like Sindile, uh, Quarantine, Kunuma, less so because they're further away. But if there's any young male leopards coming from anywhere around, uh, they, could, they are the biggest threat to the cubs. Uh, male leopards that are seeking their own territory. Now what we're looking for, when you see me lean out of the car or peer ahead like that, at the moment I'm looking for those exquisitely beautiful small pad marks of Karula, the dominant female leopard on Juma. Now this is the area we've been seeing her the most in recently, and the southern section of the reserve. Good morning, Sarah in California. Now, Sarah is wondering, well, how does leopard hierarchy work? How does dominance work? 
Now, as with most predators, whoever's the most aggressive wins. And, and, and that's a, pretty much a general rule with most animals out in the African bush. So male leopards, who is ever the most aggressive, the best fighter, and the, not necessarily the biggest all the time, but the, the best fighter is the one who will be dominant. And the same goes for the females. If a female leopard is, is not aggressive or not strong enough to defend her territory, it will be taken by another female. And that's pretty much how it works with, well, lions are slightly different. He's, got, he's back to us here, Brian. It's the most exquisite little bird. It's hopping a little bit low, I think. It is an orange-breasted bushrike. I heard it calling. There we go, look at that. Oh, you're just too pretty. So you can see the yellow face mask every now and then, when, but it is hopping around. It is one of the skulking, there we go, look at that. One of our skulking species. And we hear them far more often than we see them. So it's really exciting when we get one of these gorgeous birds on, on camera. The orange-breasted bushrike. Uh, coffee, tea or me? That's what their call sounds like. <laughs> coffee, tea or me? Oh, jumping around. And off it goes. Oh, wonderful. No, uh, so, Bebop, it's gone to the next bush. I'll show you now. If we can get that one last view, it would be wonderful. But I think I saw it fly out of the back. It's in that little thicket there in the base. But, oh, it's gonna be, no, off it hops. Okay, well, we tried. Gorgeous bird, gave us a, a very brief glimpse, but nonetheless, wonderful to see them. So it was amazing, as I heard it call. Oh, there's another one, is it? Okay, a little bit more to the left. Trying to see. You got him? There we go. Well done, Brian. There we go. It's another one. It's a pair of them. Oh, this one's being a bit nicer. Whoop. So busy birds. And they hop around a lot. Whoop. So the most, both of the common bush shrike species we get here, both have grey heads. So that one is the smaller of the two. Where is my collection? There we go. Um, that is the smaller of the two, uh, the orange-breasted bushrike. Now, it's got that wonderful yellow face mask, um, and it is quite physically quite a bit smaller than the grey-headed bushrike, which is the other bushrike we get here. There is also a possibility, but I haven't even heard them calling here. Uh, they generally prefer slightly wetter areas around bigger rivers, which is the gorgeous bushrike. So there we go, that's what we've just seen. And I was talking about that sort of, I call it a face mask, but they call it an eyebrow here. You can see that wonderful yellow that creeps into the gray. Now, if we go to the gray headed bushrike, you can see a solid gray head, a far more robust bill, but it also has an orange breast. So the orange breasted has a gray head and an orange breast, and the gray headed has an orange breast and a grey head, but lacks those that yellow facial mask. Now, the gorgeous bushrike, which is the one that might possibly occur here, is one of the smallest of the bushrike species and one of the most exquisitely beautiful. Now, they might move up here during the rainy season, but I haven't heard them calling once. And they've got quite, let's see. All right. Oh dear, no, I need to turn the thingy on to make the call work. One second. And I love this call. See, my whistling is horrific. Maybe Brian can do a better whistle. Let's hear it again. It's much better than me. Well done, there, Brian. It's just, but yeah, that's that. That would be a great coup to see that up in the northern Sabi sands. I've seen them in the southern Sabi sands around the Sand River, around the Sabi River and Kruger. But there is a possibility in wetter times that they might move up here.
while we keep checking down here in the south for the queen let's go back to jamie and see how her lion search is going well my lion search is going very well in the sense that i have absolutely established where they didn't go which sounds ridiculous but is actually really useful in terms of figuring out where they did go and now we're going back to square one which is checking around the Juma Pan where we know they were last night and trying to figure out from there exactly which way they went. I don't think they went onto quarantine. And I say that because both Brent and myself started off our search this morning for Tingana in that area. I say that and I am mistaken. Are there lions somewhere that I've missed somewhere? Because <laughs> they definitely walked up here. Okay, hold on a second. I'm going to show you what I'm looking at. One of the males was with them. I just want to double check this. That it's not just a male. Not just a male, but... No, it's definitely not. Because there's tiny, itsy bitsy little feet. Okay, let me try and show you what I'm looking at. Sure, so tiny I actually can't even see them properly. Okay, let's turn around. I wonder if these lionesses don't have a kill somewhere. It's very hard to see into this kind of light. Let's try keep the vehicle's shadow away from it. All right, I'm going to hop out and show you what I'm looking at and hopefully find one of those tiny little tracks to show you. And also just check that we didn't miss them lying in the bushes somewhere, but I don't think we did. So, the male's tracks, can you see them from here, Zander? Cool, perfect, thank you. Sorry, not male, big female probably even amber eyes. She's got the biggest feet of all of them. The tracks are here. This is the back track, slightly more elongated with its toes. And this is the front track, slightly more rounded. Now, if we scoot over a little bit, okay, give you a size comparison. Here's my hand. Stretches basically over the track, but not by much. Let's go over here and have a look at the itsy bitsy ones tiny little cub tracks smaller than a female leopard and there's so many of them they were scampering I go over here they were scampering and playing with each other running after the adults up towards that patch where we tracked them to yesterday so did we miss something yesterday somewhere in the drainage system it's entirely possible I'm looking for the even tinier ones because these are the bigger cubs somewhere I saw something even smaller really tiny little feet but they might have been stumbling stumbling behind and stepped on by mom okay so this changes our approach when i said they didn't go movement attracted my attention sorry when i said they didn't go west i was mistaken they did go west but they didn't go as far as zoe's road because we would have picked up on their tracks there. So where did they go? Probably into that drainage system that they love so much. Let us go and investigate. Brent for Jamie. Okay, right. Brent, did you drive Rebecca's? Uh, negative. I did the one to things. Copy, it looks as though at least some of these in Ghana have come towards quarantine from the dam. I'm on the business heading towards Southern Bali now, but I will. Come back to Pindam um, and come to Jan. Okay, copy, thanks. I'll just keep an eye out for them. I'll keep searching. Is 
So Karen has suggested that we go and we check the other side of the dam wall and towards that drainage system. The difficulty is these tracks are going in the opposite direc direction, but it's only one of them. And it might have been that she was taking the cubs to join up with the rest of the females and she might not have known exactly where they were. So she might have been calling to them and then changed her mind and gone somewhere separate. Because as I said, we didn't pick up anything on the western side, so perhaps she didn't go all the way along here. The one thing I have noticed though, and I noticed it this morning as well, but then of course they also had a leopard calling. There's nothing on quarantine. There's no grazers, there's no browsers, there's nothing. There was nothing here this morning as well when we arrived. And that's almost invariably a sign. It's the first thing we check for when we wake up in the morning and Brent and myself drive to the DRC, which is the main camp. The first thing we look for is eyes, eye shine on quarantine and whether or not there's impala or wildebeest or anything like that. Because if there aren't, it immediately tells us something and it tells us that a predator has come through. Which we know Tingana must have done. The question is, did the lions as well? I stopped at that track and I suggested it might be amber eyes since she does seem to have enormous feet. Justin would like to know how rare the amber eyed gene is in lions. Mm, it's it's not that rare. It's, let's say it's not as rare as the brown eyed gene in leopards. The amber eyed gene, there's one Styx female that had amber eyes. I'm not sure if I haven't seen her in a while. There was definitely a Styx female with amber eyes. You see amber eyed females maybe once, one every 10 individuals or maybe a little bit less than that, one every 20. So it, it does occur naturally, we do see it on in different lion prides, it does make that individual very distinctive. But if I were to have a guess, I would suggest that perhaps it is in some way a recessive gene, just because in, of all of the Inkahumas only one of them has it, only Amber Eyes has it, and then even with the, the two cubs that had, that were identical, that were sisters, one had the Amber Eyes and one had the surviving member had orange uh, eyes, the sort of normal yellow eyes. Okay, Karen. I'm going to go and check the other side of the dam wall. That wasn't for us, by the way, that update. This is a sighting out of our boundaries, out of our traverse area. It is very, very quiet here. Quiet like perhaps a pride of lions walk through here. And a lovely update then, Karen helping us out once more to say that she was watching them heading towards the dam wall when the stream froze but the Zoomies still had control of it and could see them going over. Well, we know they didn't come out at... Well, we don't, actually. I didn't check all the way to Central Road. I'm going to check south. I'm going to check that drainage system there. I'm still hopeful. I am really still am hopeful because nobody's picked up any tracks of them crossing out of Juma. While we go searching for something to show you, and we'll, get, we'll keep looking for animals along the way, let's jump on the back with Brent and find out what he's looking for this morning. Well, currently we are looking at a large male giraffe. He's munching on a bush willow. Now, a giraffe's tongue is 50 centimeters long. Isn't that incredible? And has the constitution of an old boot. It can wrap itself around large thorns, spiny branches. And you can see it's a boy because he's balding. The females have hair on the top tufts of their horns, uh, while the male is quite bald. This looks like a very nice old male. 
or one of the dominant males. Munging, munging, munging. Now, it looks like, yes, it is. He's eating a tamburji tree. Now, a tamburji tree is uh, noxious. Certain animals do eat it. If they have a uh, infestation of, of tapeworms or any other such things but I think in this case I've noticed quite a few species eating Timburti because it's one of the only trees that's got leaves and nutrients left at the moment. I'm just going to try to slide a little bit further so his nose doesn't keep disappearing behind the leadwood. Are we going to be able to make it fine? There we go. Oh, oh, no, he doesn't like that. Okay, we'll stay here. So, speaking of different trees, Rich Levy is wondering... Do we have any Mapani trees in the safari, in the safari, in the Sabi sands, or just in the Timbavati? Um, well, the Mapani belt starts to the north of us, so there are no Mapanis in the Sabi sands, and that Mapani belt extends up through the majority of Zimbabwe, quite a lot of Mozambique, and then west along the Limpopo River, into Botswana, into eastern Namibia, and up to the Zambezi River, and north of the Zambezi River into Zambia. He's giving us the the long, the long look. Now, this particular form of giraffe is known as the South African giraffe. And most of the giraffes are separated into their subspecies by their markings. And while he's hiding behind that Timburti tree, and not in the best light, I'll show, have, show you quickly uh, are the different markings of the giraffe. So, there we go. The bottom one is what we've got here, which is either the Angolan and the South African, which is, they're probably very closely related, and they do crossbreed, and their ranges do overlap. Now, and we have the Maasai, which you can see is quite different. And possibly one of the most striking, a little bit further to the north, which is the reticulated, which is that one there. And then the Rothschild, which is one of the rarest subspecies of giraffe. And then finally the West African that occurs way out there in the Sahel region of uh, West Africa. Now, the interesting thing about this whole area here, now, just w just to the north of that, that's the Sahara Desert. And the Sahara Desert wasn't always a desert. It wasn't, sorry, Brian, I'm moving a bit too quick for you there. Uh, it wasn't, I just wanted to find something else. It wasn't always a desert. It was a massive grassland savanna, similar to what the Maasai Mara or Serengeti would be, but, but much, much bigger. And I just want to find, I know there's a picture of it here somewhere. And so the giraffe would have been spread well throughout that area. And one of the oldest petroglyphs, I'm just trying to see, I'm sure I had a picture of the petroglyph, in the world is of a life-size giraffe on one of the uh, granite inselbergs there. And that is incredible. So giraffes used to be far more widely spread in West Africa. And that was just basically due to the Sahil region. Now, in other 
art there. Oh, I don't have that. I must have to, I'm gonna have to find a picture of that petroglyph. But so look at the, that. He, he's chewing on a cud. So it is a ruminant. And it was the the Kiffians or Nubians were responsible for that life-size rock engraving of two giraffes. And Triton is wondering what is necking and is it like fighting uh, with each other's necks? Triton, that's exactly what necking is. So it is the way male giraffes fight and that's the main reason they've evolved this, this long neck is for breeding. So the longer your neck, uh, like any pendulum, the harder you can swing and the harder you can beat your opponent. Now giraffes have been a, fascinate, or a fascination to, to people for many thousands of years. And many of the great menageries uh, in Constantinople, uh, oh, the Grand, the Grand, Alexandra, the Great Library and stuff, uh, the Great Library was actually attached to, to a zoo that had a lot of these wild animals, including giraffe. But I think the longest traveling giraffe of all time in, in ancient times was uh, to China. So the Ming Dynasty got giraffe from Egypt and brought them through to the emperor. And he had a massive fascination with a lot of African fauna. I mean, there's a, 16th, a 14th century painting of a giraffe in China being led by its keeper. So how's that there, Brian? So isn't that incredible? Okay. Well, we're going to leave that giraffe because it doesn't look too comfortable. Could be the wind. Oops, sir. So, I'm not quite sure I understand this question uh, completely, uh, but Dispatch Griffin is saying, I've heard that giraffe adapt uh, and, uh, to people very easily. Now, there are cases of it and, and easy to feed them out of the hand. They're a very passive animal unless you're a lion trying to eat them. So, there is, there is, they, they do adapt um, quite easily. I mean, the great example of that is giraffe manna in Kenya. Uh, those are only reason those giraffe are around the manor there is because they are the critically endangered Rothschild's giraffe. Uh, and even if animals do adapt easily, I still believe they should, uh, outside of obviously certain circumstances where a species needs saving, saving I, I believe that they should be left to the wild. But yes, they can be tamed quite easily. Whether you should tame them, different story. We're going to keep checking here along the western edge of the Mawati River. And while we do that, let's go see how Jamie's lion hunt is going. And a very big thank you to Karen and for all of those of you who sent through updates as to where these lions have gone. We're getting warmer. I've just found one set of female tracks disappearing in towards Nyala Road South. So that's our next port of call. The, th the only thing that's making me question what's happening here is that there's only one set of tracks. So I want to double check the eastern side as Karen suggested and then decide maybe we should just drive Hyena Road. It's given us luck before. We will, but first we'll drive in Yala Road south. I'm tossing up where we should go. They haven't come along Central Road from what I can see. Hyena Road has brought us so much luck in terms of lion sightings over the last few weeks so that that will be my next port of call but for now one set of tracks is telling me to go and check the drainage system around Nyala Road so that is where we shall go first and I just want to contact Brent because if he's on the western side of the Mulwati I'm just going to ask him to keep an eye out for tracks coming out there Brent for Jamie Standing by. 
Brent, I've got in Konzo for at least one Mufazi going into the block between Vulture's Nest and Yala Road South. Maybe just if you're around the Mulwati, just check around there. Copy, I'm at Spaghetti Junction. What I'll do is I'll go back um, on the road and head north from there. Copy, thank you. And this is why the Game Drive channel is so, so important to us in terms of our day-to-day -day game drives. It helps us plan and tell people to look out for the different animals in this area. So, one of my favorite roads on Juma is in the Inyala Road Road, south and north, because it's got this beautiful river system that runs alongside it. It's also really a nice road for looking for traps. Go ahead, Ephraim. Sean, what are you give me? You could be my day in Ghana. Just a drive. Affirmative, thanks, Ephraim. We had him earlier this morning. Now I get a beat. Yeah, he came from the night. Okay, Brent's got that conversation. This is also Artfark Haven. We found some amazing freshly dug holes on this road before. It's a little bit too warm now. The winter's edge in terms of viewing nocturnal creatures is slowly disappearing. Uh, winter is the perfect time. If you are out to see something small and nocturnal and maybe a little bit rare in terms of what you could see, winter is the best time to come and visit the African bush. Just because just because all kinds of amazing things are out, pangolins out in the middle of the day, sometimes even civets and porcupines come out to forage because it's nice and cool. Somebody's hiding. <laughs> Can you see it, Zander? You got it. It's a really tricky spot. There's a couple of them in here. So Manyala hiding, hiding away. Now they would be very useful spies for us. There you go. You can sort of see something. Maybe. You'll have to take my word for it. Nyala are very, very good at playing hide and seek. And they would be useful spies if perhaps the lions had come through here because they'd give us a call with that deep booming bark of theirs but unfortunately they're playing very discreet for now and they are truly truly hidden in the vegetation i can just see flashes of white every now and again i'm not even sure if you guys could see those in yala doesn't look like they're giving us any indication that they're going to come out so we'll keep on in our search for the lions. And Tiki, is so, that question was so perfectly timed. Tiki's question was whether we ever get visitors from our Safari Live fans, whether they ever come and stay at the lodges and perhaps come and visit us. And as you, as you ask that, Brent is currently discussing with Ephraim a site visit with the guests from Cheetah Plains who are Safari Live viewers and they want to come and see us all, perhaps get a little bit of a behind the scenes glimpse into what happens at the start of our safaris. So yes, we do. A lot of our Safari Live fans come and visit the Sabi Sands and have a chance to see the characters that they've seen on our live safaris up close and personal, which I can imagine must be an extremely exciting experience for them. And I know of quite a few who've come through and had a chance to see Karula, for example, or any one of our magical cat species. They've popped out here and they've come into this drainage system somewhere here. Everybody look very carefully. These, tresh, these tracks are beautifully fresh. And they've gone straight into this river system here. Sorry, Tiki, I'll get back to your question in one second. I know they're here. We're getting warmer. Definitely getting warmer. Track straight off the road and into that river system. 
So we do get visitors, they get to come and see. Basically what we tend to do is we will invite them along at the start, the hour before our sunrise, no, not our sunrise for that would be insane. They would not want to get up that early. But our sunset safari, then what they'll do is they'll come and watch us set up the vehicles and have a quick chat. And we'll introduce ourselves and then they go and they get to sit in final control for a little bit of a, a, an introduction to all of our checks. Our clapping for sync and tapping our microphones and all of those things. I'm going to follow up on these lines, they're in here somewhere. And while I go for a little bit of a stroll, let's go across to Brent who is on a river cruise. So Jamie's asked me to check for lion tracks in the Mawati and I've taken this opportunity. I was getting a bit tired of driving so I'm just letting the sand drive for me. So if you look to the driver's seat, because Brian's on camera, there's no one driving. But it's a good way, it's the only time I get to sit on my tracker's seat and uh, keep a lookout for tracks a little bit closer. Now the last time I did this, a lion ran in front of me so we're hoping that we can tempt fate and have it happen twice. But we are getting to the end of the area where we're able to do this. So we'll keep going for another little bit. So we're hoping to find lion tracks or even better lions uh, while sitting here. Although I did hear a nice bird calling. But I don't see any tracks yet, so back to the driver's seat, back to work. Oh dear. Oh, there we go. Before we get to where the tracks might get con... Oh, where's my ears going? Confused. And let's see, which way is the car going to choose? And that's the way we're going to go. Ah, it's chosen to the right. Oh, sorry, I just need to chat to Jamie quickly. Sorry, Jamie, can you go again with that update, please? <laughs> There's Jamie. <laughs> Never mind, there you are. There's Jamie, Jerry, and Zunder. We're all searching for the lions. Do you want to check Batley? No, you go ahead. Go check Batley. I'll go walk from that yeah. side. Okay, perfect. We're um, just a little bit south of where we had them in that drainage before, where we took the whole team to go see them. Okay, the perfect. <laughs> So Jamie's going to go back to the other side and take a walk and we're going to make sure that their tracks don't pop out over here. Okay, so exciting. The cubs around here somewhere with those lions. So quite a quite a bit far to the to the east is where the tracks go into into this area. Okay, and it's unlikely we're going to miss tracks on this nice soft road. So I'm going to go a little bit quicker because we think they're a bit further along. that flying it landed in the dead tree Brian bottom left hand corner is it another harrier hawk no yes it is another harrier hawk is it yes another harrier hawk this one at least is sitting in a little bit better of a spot for us to view you can see those incredibly long legs that it's able to dislocate and that a dead tree look at he's putting his foot right into a hole now as I said, a dead tree, lots of holes, lots of places for things to live in. So it's searching for something to eat. 
it's putting its head there, peering into a hole, seeing if it's worth putting its foot in. It's decided not. And watch how it works its way through the dead tree, looking into all the holes, seeing if there are any potential breakfast spots. Oh, off he goes. Our ex ranger was wondering, in all my travels, have we ever found anything that's not been classified or named yet? Um, possibly. Uh, we've sent in some insects and frogs from the Gabonese rainforest. We're not sure whether they were named or uh, classified yet, uh, but uh, those type of things take a long time. So we'll probably only probably hear whether we were right or not by the time I'm 60 years old. Oh, I think he's going to fly. Okay, we're just checking where that Harrier hawk was going. He's disappeared now. Decided there's not enough to keep him entertained in around the Nyala road drainage system. Quite a few hyena tracks, but no lion tracks yet. Okay, well, Jamie and I are both in search of the Inkahumas at the moment, so let's go see how her search on the northern side of the drainage is going while we continue on the south. We can actually see her. <laughs> Our search is relatively unsuccessful for now. We're desperately checking in the thick vegetation. Unfortunately, I think the only way that we're going to spot them is if they either lift their heads or we go for a little bit of a walk to see whether or not they're somewhere in this vicinity. Jerry's just asked a very pertinent question, which is whether or not they might go back to the same spot that we found them lying in not too long ago. Because we took the whole, after the sunrise safari, we took the whole crew out to go and have a look at the lions, because they don't always get to have a look at them. They watch from the final control room, but it's really nice to go out every now and again to go and see the animals in the flesh, so to speak, kind of like what we were talking about with our viewers coming to visit. They're going straight into that same spot. Straight in. Let's just do a little jiggle here. Their tracks cross this open patch. Walked around here, they lay down here, they swish their tails there, and they have got to be somewhere here. Come on, lions. So we're following straight on their tracks. I think I just drove through some lion scat, judging by the scent that is slowly wafting across us, and that's fresh. Woo! This is a tricky spot. It's the sort of spot where the bushes suddenly go burr at you when you go for a walk. I'm just listening, in case they're still on the move. Oh, these tracks are so fresh. They've even stopped to sleep in this particular open patch. And they've probably, now that it's got hot, they've moved out of the sun and into the shade somewhere in the drainage system. I'm still, still chatting to you. I'm not going far. Is something going to go brr? Oh, the wind is rustling the trees. There's so many hiding spots for lions here. Can you hear horn bulls? I'm also listening for contact calls from the cubs. Because as you know, the cubs are not often, they don't actually go that quiet. Even when the lionesses are sleeping, they've got the ow, ow sound. I'm doing that really softly because I prefer not to call a mother lion to me. 
They didn't go that way. They must have come on this side. You're getting a little bit of a background view or a background glance into the way in which we go searching for the animals when we're off the vehicle. It's very windy. Which tells me how fresh these tracks are actually. They're not far from them. Let's just go around and check Central Road, otherwise I'm sure that they're in this spot somewhere. This is a very tricky spot to get our vehicles into, but at least they've been kind this morning. Unlike yesterday morning where they walked all over the property and kept us guessing as to their last known position. Now they've picked one spot and gone in that direction. Now you don't need to be concerned when we do something like that. We've already checked the area very carefully before we get out of the vehicle to make sure that we're not about to step on somebody's tail, which is like stepping on somebody's toes, but with more serious consequences. So you definitely don't need to worry, we checked already, and all I was doing was making sure that I could see into the dip. And it's a nice way of doing it because if you're looking from that side kind of angle, if you're looking down towards them, you've got the advantage of height and also you're not as much of a threat because there's an obstacle between you and the animals so they don't get a huge fright when you do something like that. Okay, copy. Brent's got their tracks on the other side of the drainage line and that's why it really helps having two people to jump between searching for something because it means that we can keep checking. What direction are those tracks going in? I'm not sure they go the right I'm just going to check uh, on the other side to see which area. Copy. We had tracks of the cubs going into this drainage system. We do not have tracks of the cubs coming out of it. Which means that the lionesses are off on the hunt, stashing their cubs in a nice secret and safe hiding hole. And we spoke before about the ethics of viewing the cubs because Brent has got those tracks there. I'm not going to go and walk and look for those cubs because then we know that they are out or they're all alone without mom. No, we're not going to go walking through there. We'll just leave them be and wait for mom to come back and collect them. So there we go. We've got a nice answer to what's happening with our lions. Now what I'm going to do is go and check Buffles with Dam. Perhaps one of the lionesses has decided to go and have a drink there. I'll, whenever I come around this corner, I will never ever forget it. And it's one of those things that stick with you. And even, even though I know where Tingana is, I had one drive where we had to delay the start of the sunset safari because it was too hot for us to go out. And I came around this corner, Scott was on camera with me. I came around this corner and Tingana, I was like this and this tree had leaves. Tingana was lying right, right next to my vehicle, staring up at me. It was such an intense moment, such a lovely surprise as well. And I just kept driving. I just kept driving past him and then turned around further up the hill because he was so, so, he'd just been sleeping. And obviously we took each other by surprise. He was so close, he was looking right up into my eyes and I just thought, okay, we'll carry on. And it's amazing how one's brain looks for that animal in the same place each and every single time even though you know in your own mind that that animal is not going to still be there 
You can't help, you cannot resist that temptation. It was just after Karula's cubs had been born. Now, speaking of our different leopards, Anna Marie would like to know if there's any more new information about where Sindile is. The last update we had, he was doing some serious moving about and he'd moved south towards Marla Marla and Londolozi, that side of things. He'd spent actually quite a considerable period of time um, around Arethusa, around the lodge. His, basically, we spoke about it yesterday, his natal range, where he was born and where he grew up, which is fascinating in its own way because you can't help but wonder about whether he moved back into the back into the area copy thanks that he knows and is that he knows and is familiar with which makes sense he knows all of the good escape routes he knows all of the good spots to go and hide it's just the perfect spot for him to be but at some point soon he's going to start dispersing and he's going to start moving further and further away from where we'll have a chance to see him, I think. I don't think he's going to stick around too close. Brent has been doing a marvellous job in helping us out. Apparently the lionesses have changed direction and are now coming back towards where I am now. So while we focus carefully on trying to find them, let's go back to Brent and see how he's doing. Well, I'm about to have a, a morning meeting with Taxi here. Morning, Taxi. I found you the leopard. Where's my lions? Oh. Uh, somewhere there. Oh, they're somewhere here. Okay. <laughs> um, the light is still on. Oh, my lights are still on. There we go. Uh, then Konzo goes north into this block here towards Central. I don't know. I think Jamie's coming on Central. I might go. Uh, okay. Unless you want to go towards Buffalzok. No, it's fine. No, we we'll just keep it. Okay, cool. Good luck. <laughs> no problem. Hopefully we'll find some lions shortly. Okay. So, there's tracks of it. I can see two lionesses going probably parallel to where we're running now. So we're checking in the quarry thickets carefully. Jamie's coming on central. So I'm going to leave central to her. I'm going to check a little bit further to the east towards quarry pan. Oh, there's Jamie. We're all around here looking for the lions. Hello, again. Yes. They're coming through somewhere probably about 100 meters down from here. Um, do you want to carry on that way? And I'll go this way. I'll go check quarry pan yeah. down the road. <laughs> One cub track. I only have two lioness. Okay. So we've got a plan. And let's hopefully, hopefully we're going to find something. Yeah. Well, you, know what we, you know what we're going to do? We're going to undo Geraldine's shoelaces. Come here, Geraldine. Undo your shoe. There we go. Bye, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Jamie got the other one. Okay, so we're going to go very, very slowly because this road is quite hard. And if they were hunting, they're not going to stick on the roads like they do sometimes. They're going to just go straight across so it's very easy to miss those tracks. Okay, so I've followed them through this area before and it is pretty much a lucky packet to where they might have crossed. So they're not, they're not, they're not marching, so they're hunting, so they're not sticking on like a big elephant path or uh, all on the road. So it does make the tracking a little bit more fun. Okay, so... While we're looking for lions, I've got a question for you. 
about kitty cats and in lions in particular. What is the little bone or little organ mechanism that enables lions to roar? What is that called? And if you know the answer to that, pop me an email, questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So if we go from where the tracks went exactly off, it might be around here where there's very hard ground. I'm just going very, very slowly, almost not moving at all. Now, as I said, the tracks can be almost impossible to see if you are not going at snail's pace, especially if they're hunting or running, and especially on hard soil like this. Now, you're just going to have to take my word for it. But that is a running lioness track. <laughs> so I can see, just from the general shape, I can see a little bit of claws, and she shot through here at speed. And there's the next track. And really hard ground. I'm looking at the tiniest little mark in the sand. So I'm have a quick look where the grounds are possibly a bit easier here. There we go. Now the other problem is if she's running, it's not so she's when she walks, you've got a footprint, a footprint. A footprint when she's running you've got a footprint 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 so it does make it much more difficult and they have crossed at the exact worst time so there's one lioness there the second lioness that one's even harder to see than the first one because it's only half on soft soil okay well update Jamie on the radio this is probably the easier one to see where she's just put her it's too close. Oh. But I mean, this is, this is, this is not, let me just move. This is what you call, um, this is serious tracking. This is not uh, an easy tracking segment at all. When you get it there, we're still too close. You got it? So you can see where I've drawn that line in the sand. And, oh, there we go. Just trying to see, sorry, my monitor. Um, where are we looking right now? I think it's, I think we're still too. Where's my line? There's my line. Okay, so there you can just make out the back three little lobes and one, and you can see the toes, but sure, that's not an easy track to spot. Okay, let's tell Jamie. Jamie, Jamie. Jamie, the tracks across uh, north across Central Road, heading to probably about a hundred meters to the south of Quarry Pan, if they keep on that same line. Okay, copy, thanks. Um, have you checked in Yellow Road North? Copy, I think it might be worth just having a squiz around Buffalo Hook as well. Okay, so the tracks are heading there. Oh, well done. It seems like that was too easy for a quiz. Everyone is saying the hyoid bone or the hyoid apparatus. That's correct. So in small cats like your cat at home, the hyoid bone is a bone. Uh, and in big cats, it's actually cartilage and it's elastic. So when they pass air over it, it vibrates and that enables them to roar. That's why big cats can roar and little cats meow. Okay, so we know they've crossed. So there's two options. They could have headed towards the Buffalo Hook waterhole uh, and then through towards Hyena Road. 
Now, if the cub's there, they might be doing a loop back down towards where they left the cubs. So, I'm going to check Nyala Road North. I'm still checking through into the bush here, seeing if we can spot anything. And while we make our way towards Nyala Road North, uh, let's go see how Jamie's doing on Goripan Road. I've skipped out Goripan Road because it taxis driving along there. And just an update, they found the mating leopards West of Tamburti Dam, it is Mbula once again, and I'll get clarification as to exactly which female it is. She seems to be causing some confusion on the Game Drive channel. And I'll ask Tax when I go and deliver his blanket that I've picked up off the road and go and return it to him. But the line tracks are leading us in circles within circles within circles again. They're obviously hungry and they're on the move and they're hunting. Let's go and check Bivels of Dam because it's a really good place to start. The one thing that did happen to us, and it happened so fast that we couldn't even get it on our camera to show you, was a herd of elephants came barreling past us, and, and I'm, sure, I'm not sure if barreling is the right word to describe the way a frightened elephant herd moves. Thundering, perhaps, is slightly a better description. They came th thundering past us and off into the bush. They had a very, very, very tiny little calf with them. Uh, it wasn't quite that big, that is a slight exaggeration. But a, a newborn calf, little t stumbling thing racing across. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to catch up with them when they relax a little bit. But I just wonder whether or not an encounter with lions perhaps didn't cause the the reaction that we saw. Perhaps just the smell of lions in the air might have frightened them. It's also become very windy which in turn also scares elephant herds. They become very restless and frightened. Now that might be the reason behind it as well. I wonder where these lions have gone. If we get here and they're sitting at Buffelshook Dam, there is going to be a worldwide cheer at finding them out in the open. Maybe, maybe there'll be cubs gambling everywhere at the dam, just like we've seen before. Mothers resting up, cubs playing with sticks and elephant dung. I hope we're all putting those positive thoughts into the air because we're about to get to Buffelshook Dam. And I would really, really, really like that to be the case. Now come on, lions. Please be at Buffelshook Dam. Lying up, cubs everywhere, calling, mom's trying to sleep. I can picture the scene in my mind. I'm still picturing it. I'm not seeing it, but I'm picturing it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> it was a brave attempt at visualization. Oof. Wow, I haven't been to Buffelsook Dam in a while. I'm not sure it qualifies as a dam anymore. And, oh, a little bit pungent as well. Now my predictions about Buffelsook Dam being dry by the end of July definitely didn't come true. That was because we had that enormous rainfall the one night. But I think the end of August may be the time frame that we're looking at now. Okay, so can you picture it? I can picture it in my own mind, and that seems to be the way that the morning's going. Imagine the lioness lying there in the shade, maybe cubs wandering about on top there, falling down, tumbling down, being incredibly cute. I'm imagining it very clearly. Nope. Unfortunately, it hasn't proved to be true. Where to next? We've checked all of the other roads. This was our last attempt, well, Brenton on Inyala Road North and my checking of Bufflesook Dam. Those were our two last attempts. Where have these lions gone? Let's go check Hyena Road. 
last ditch effort. Hyena Road right at the end saves the day once again. I'm picturing that now. If I throw out enough, enough possibilities or enough options, at some point one of them has got to come true. There we go. Safari Hayes is on my side. He thinks that the lions are on Hyena Road. We should have started there. Let's go and check Hyena Road. And if they're there, then we shall all rejoice. And they're not at Buffelsook Dam, as I was really hoping that they were. There's actually nothing at Buffelsook Dam. It's so, so quiet. I know James commented on this yesterday, and I'm feeling the same way. The bush feels eerily quiet right now. The bird song is... I don't know why the birds are so quiet. I don't know if it's perhaps the wind, perhaps there's been a little bit of disturbance with the bird. It might just even be they're seeking food elsewhere. So a lot of our noisy species have started to move off. I think the only way we're going to do this is back again. Here we go. We've got some Nyala that are slightly more visible. We missed out on the ones earlier because they were basically hidden behind the trees. I have never heard Kirsty so enthusiastic about Nyala before. <laughs> she is thrilled that we have managed to find them. And I think we might have a nicer view if we go forward because these ones are hiding behind the trees as well. One of my absolute favorite antelope. They are just so beautiful and so incredibly graceful in the way that they move. Hello, beautiful. And now they're all coming through to our direction, which is wonderful. Look at that beautiful red coat. She's got the most even white stripes of any Inyala I think I've ever seen. Look how perfectly spaced those stripes are. She looks like somebody went and drew on her with a ruler. Usually Nyala have a sort of a hodgepodge of stripes and there's some of them split into different directions and they're skew and they have little kinks in them. This one is perfect. This is the, the A-type Nyala. Very organized. That delicate step across the road. Oh, barely a glance in my direction. Well, girl, you officially win the prize for the most even stripes I have ever seen on any Nyala ever, except the bits towards the back. Oops, sorry. Move my head out of the way. It's under. Next time I do that, you must have shouted me. <laughs> Slightly closer together on the back side. And here come the rest of them as she disappears. One hugely pregnant female in front. Nibbling away. That one on the right, well, the one that you're looking at right now, she is so pregnant. Look at that bulge in her belly. Nyala tend to be quite slender creatures, very graceful looking. There you can see a young male in comparison, who has now completely blocked the view I was trying to show you, but that's okay. I love the young males. <laughs> there, you see what I mean about the other Nyala stripes? They've got little bends and turns, and they're uneven. Who's coming up behind us, big girl? Oh, goodness. You must be joking. <laughs> now, herd of Vinyala delicately making their way into the drainage system. Oh, 
Okay, there go our Nyala, off into some dense vegetation. We're going to head off to Hyena Road. Last dish effort. Perhaps the hyenas, the hyenas, the lions will surprise us there. So I roll gently back into Brent. <laughs> okay, we'll go forward. Let's try to get revenge for Jerry's shoelaces. And speaking of Brent, who is right behind us, let's jump on board with him and observe the view that he has of the back of Wendy. <coughs> We're eating Jamie's dust at the moment. And believe it or not, there's someone behind us eating our dust. So it's a three car pileup for the bush. But Jamie's gonna go <coughs> check hyena, right? <coughs> We're gonna check the buffalo of boundary. But I'm pretty sure those lioness are still behind us there hunting through the block. But I think it's a good plan for this evening sunset safari to loop around this area again. If they are still hunting in that block, they're either going to pop out at Buffalo's Hook Waterhole for a drink, or what they're going to do is going to pop out and head back towards where they've left the cubs. So Jamie was trying to sneak in front of us, but we chose the faster route. I think she's going to go do the, the um, <laughs> fire break. Uh, Blobbit McBlob says, have you noticed we haven't seen any Impala? Uh, well, we have seen a few, uh, not too many this morning, but they are around. And if the big cats have been through an area, they're going to be a bit scarce. So we actually saw, the first thing we saw this morning was Impala. Uh, that were going <laughs> at Tingana. So we went from Impala to Tingana. So the Impala helped us find a Tingana this morning. Whoa. It's going to be a windy, windy day. I'm going to have to tighten up my cap. Before the wind steals it. Now, we were fortunate enough to go on an adventure to Rwanda uh, recently and that video is now up on the Safari Live Facebook page and Shamsung's wanting to know a little bit more about that female gorilla that was carrying around its dead baby. Now, that is not uncommon in, in primates uh, and actually in quite a few sort of uh, your predator species and whatnot. Now, uh, more than likely that animal was stillborn and uh, the female is still producing milk. Her hormones are all telling her to look after a baby even though it's dead. So that's just her instincts to coming through. And, 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 I, I, and baboons, I've actually seen them uh, carrying around a corpse that is, is so old it's gone dry. So it's even stopped smelling. But uh, I think in that very moist environment high up in the mountains there, that, 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 that little baby will disintegrate and it'll, it might take her a while to adjust uh, from um, that loss of, uh, of child. And you must think, uh, she, her mammary glands are lactating. She's, all the sort of chemical signals in her head are telling her she needs to look after a baby, look after a baby. And uh, that's the reason she, that, that primates often carry it around. And believe it or not, that type of behavior is, is not that uncommon in human beings as well. Uh, with the loss of a child and, and, and people don't want to let go of, of that child, Spe especially mothers because of all the, the, the hormones and stuff telling them that they should be looking after a baby. Now, a little bit off, opposite from lions, if they have a stillborn baby, they'll eat it and then start looking for it. <laughs> so it, it seems to be very much more primate, primate, primate based thing, vervet monkeys I've seen do it, um, baboons, or three different species of baboons, gorillas, uh, I, there is records of chimpanzees doing it as well but I've never seen that, I've seen um, 
sax monkeys do it. I've seen some mango monkeys do it. So it is very much a, a primate. It's an instinctual thing, and I think uh, they're just unable to grasp that loss. It takes them a while, and it takes a while for the hormones to sort of catch up with what's going on. Don't run away, please don't run away. Yesterday, I saw one, but this is my favorite antelope we get in the Sabi Sands. And it's a little boy, a little bit more back. Hello, little man. It's a little male bushbuck. Hasn't quite got his chocolatey color yet. The big males go quite dark brown. Brian doesn't like bushbuck there. No. The bushbuck of the culprits who ate all Brian's sunflowers. Sunflowers all the devoured. sunflowers devoured. Wasn't this particular individual bushbuck, so Brian, don't hold anything against him. By association. You know, he's by association, he's evil. Now, they're the most retiring of the sort of medium to large antelope we see. They skulk around in these little thickets on the edge of the, the river systems. And I love the way they walk. Because they live in thickets, they rely heavily on their ears to see potential threats. So when they walk, they will put their, watch, watch, watch his feet. So look, watch the back foot goes, boop, where the front foot was to stop any, any noise being made. I just think that's incredible. And definitely one of the little antelope I've spent so much time with and have a great affinity for, more so than the bigger ones. But I must say, all the members of the Trafalag Trafalagus family uh, are my favorite of the antelopes. And I'd say bushbuck number one, Sitatunga number two. Now for those of you who don't know what Sitatunga is, it's an incredible um, trafalagid that lives, uh, the closest it lives to here is up in northern Botswana. And its hooves are literally spread this wide and it's an aquatic antelope. It lives in the papyrus and phragmites swamps and it's able to almost walk on water because that widely splayed hoof it's able to walk on floating vegetation uh, incredible swimmers and one of their defense mechanisms when they're trying to get away from uh, land-based or people predators is that they'll go into the water and they will just stand on their back legs and only their nostrils will stick out of the water We, so Jamie's checking Hyena Road. We're just checking a little bit further to the west in case they came even further. And this is where James had that female and the cubs. Here we go. These have been driven over already. We keep checking down a Gauri cut line. Let's go see how Jamie's endeavors on Hyena Road are going. Come on, hyenas. Oh, hyenas. Come on, Hyena Road. Work your magic. And let the lions just be sleeping in the shade somewhere here. We're going at a snail's pace to try and find them. Somewhere in the shade. We're nearly at the end of Hyena Road. We've covered most of it already. They're not in their usual spots. Okay, so what we're looking for at this point, this temperature, the morning has warmed up spectacularly. So we're looking for lionesses lying in the shade. The quick flick of a black tipped tail will be what gives them away, or maybe their white bellies as they roll over. There's going to be cubs crawling all over them. Ow! Crawling. Please. Somewhere in the shade. It was a good bet. It was a good bet because the lionesses went on their own, the ones that Brent and myself were tracking, and they came from Hyena Road. And I'm scouring the vegetation, last ditch attempt at trying to figure out where these lions have vanished off to. 
They walked down this road. Their tracks are on the road. I feel like I've been one step behind the Inkahumas for the last two days. They've been playing games with me. Oh, here's the the massive pothole that is Hyena Road. <laughs> Look at the size of this hole. Okay. Everybody hold on. Here we go. You've always sort of come to this trying to decide whether or not you should go round it or through it. Round it is basically creating another road. Going through it means you stall. And the lions will be just on the other side of it. Oh! Eesh. There we go. Safe and through on the other side. Wendy's suspension a bit the worse for the wear. That's a termite mound. I'm sure we are so close to them. I feel I felt that way all morning. Come on, Jerry. You gotta find us the lions. Even if we did untie your shoelaces. Ah, oh dear. And so we reach the end of Hyena Road. And today, Hyena Road has not worked its magic. And with that, I think that means we have driven each and every single road on Juma. And with our lions playing hide and seek and us trying to track them down, Anna Marie would like to know whether or not the whether South Africa has a Boy Scout Association that they're still discussing this um, meeting of the different viewers coming to see us. A Boy Scout Association that will teach boys to track the different animals. We do have the Boy Scouts, we also have Girl Scouts and I used to see them in Johannesburg often tying knots and camping and doing all kinds of wonderful things in that respect. Anna Marie, I don't know if any of them teach animal tracking. I can tell you that when we were children and we went on school camps we'd often go to not um, game reserves with big dangerous animals but we'd go to nature reserves and there they would teach us about the different tracks of animals which by the way includes or does not include the lion tracks that are now walking this way on this road. Just pointing that out. They are now back on this road going back towards Juma Dam. So we'll keep looking. I hope all hope is not lost. They are somewhere here. I don't know whether any of the Boy Scouts badges or whatever it is they happen to do focus on tracking of animals. It'd be something that would be great fun. But perhaps not a, a lot of little boys tracking lions. And, the, and it's, that raises an interesting point, which is the fact that lions, big cats, react very different, including cheetah, and cheetah are not a threat to human beings. They react very, very differently to children. And that's why it's important to make sure that if you bring, do bring your children to an area like this, that you monitor them very carefully and that they're not barreling about, even, even in a fenced camp, they're not running up and down and round in circles because it's very, very dangerous. Even kids, and if you watch it on safaris, if you've got kids that start to squeal or scream in the back of a vehicle around a lion sighting, it changes the situation completely because they respond. It's like a distress call to them. They respond by looking up and they'll look straight at that child. So you can bring, you absolutely can bring your children out here safely and your guides will look after them, but it is important to remember that you have an equal responsibility in terms of watching the way that they behave. Hey, Karen, I bet these lines have been hiding in that drainage line by Vintella Dam the entire time. Because that's, 
Their tracks are going back this way again. Circles within circles. I'm going to do one more search of the drainage line close to the Boyatella Dam. And while I do that, it's time for me, unfortunately, to say goodbye. We'll just have to try again on this afternoon's sunset safari to try and find these lines for you. But a lovely morning all around and really stunningly warm. Spring is in the air once again. So a big thank you to Zander for his fantastic camera work and his company, as well as to Kirsty and Rebecca in Final Control. And most of all, a very big thank you to all of you, first of all, for your help this morning in terms of finding the different animals albeit unsuccessfully in terms of the lions. And a big thank you for your questions, your comments, and again, your company on the back of our vehicle. I'll see you on the Sunset Safari, but for now, bye-bye. Not what we expected to find towards the end of the safari. It's a hinged terrapin marching across quarantine in the gusting wind. Now, maybe the little Juma pan is getting too full of terrapins and he's been pushed out. But it's quite late. Normally they walk like this is during the night or in the early morning. Now, in the direction he's going, I don't know of any water. Now they are capable of hibernation, or not hibernation is the incorrect word. Oh, I'm trying to remember, S A A A. I've gone blank now. S. Oh, I can't remember. Well, basically, lowering their metabolism and hiding in a hole. <laughs> there is a fancy word for it, but I've just drawn a complete blank. I think that's what this chap might be up to. But walking at this time of the day out in the middle of an open area makes them quite vulnerable. There we go. It looks like he's trying to find somewhere to to hide. He's going to try to scuttle under that little log. It's a very small log to be scuttling under. Or maybe he's going for, I'm a rock defense. And he's decided that there's no, no space under there. Shame. Now, obviously the drought is not only affecting the big animals that we see, it's also affecting the little animals like the terrapin. And thank you very much for um, final control. Eastivation was the word I'd drawn a complete blank on. I think it sounds better when you say lowering your heart rate and hiding in a hole. <laughs> now they are able to smell water from quite some distance and they do move between different puddles and pans. But as I said, there are not many puddles and pans to move to in this drought. But I don't want to disturb him and make him feel a little bit nervous because we're sitting near him. So I'm going to move away so he can take his chances with the predatory birds and other creatures that might find him a delectable little snack. So it's been an interesting sunrise at Safari. This is the first morning I've been out where the wind was actually starting before dawn. And when you get that, you know the rest of the day is going to be seriously windy. And you can actually see the trees and stuff starting to get now. And I think the wind's going to increase as the day goes on. Now, that's a good thing for the predators. And we do know there's quite a few different animals around to look for on the Sunset Safari. We left Tingana napping atop a termite mound. There are five Birmingham, or three Birmingham boys, sorry, uh, on Arethusa, uh, which are also a possibility. I think they might come back to Juma. And there is a report of the Stex Pride down on Cheetah Plains. So, and of course, we know the Incahumas are somewhere on Juma. And uh, we're just going to have to pull them out of the bush by their tail. But you've got to be extra careful walking in this strong, windy weather. Uh, you can surprise the animals or the animals might surprise you. And for Blobby or Blob Mac Blob, there is an Impala in the distance. Here we go, one male impala. Uh, so for Brian and myself and the rest of the Safari Live crew, see you in a few hours for the sun set safari.